book of the apostles, or the acts of the apostles. How about going through it? I'm sure you guys can see that a, a better name would yet be known as the acts of the Holy Spirit. Yeah. Right? yeah. Just seeing how powerful the Holy Spirit is and how, how, how it's moving all over the world, right? Amen. In Acts chapter 1, verse 8, you see that Jesus gives us the outline and the vision of the early church. Indeed, the whole book of Acts, where it says, But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. You will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Amen. See, it's the vision of the apostles. It was the command of the early church. And it's our title today, The Evangelization of the Nations in One Generation. <laughs> well, now most people start to say the church started in the year 33 AD. Well, uh, it's more likely that it was more like 29 AD where Jesus wasn't born at zero, but he was born at 4 BC. And by the time we end today, we'll be finishing off where Paul's in, in Rome, and he writes the book of Colossians, in which he says, this is the gospel that you have heard, has been proclaimed to every creature under heaven. Wow. Wow. God, Paul got the job done in one generation. Yeah, Paul got the job done. Now turn with me to Acts chapter 9. Come on, Come on, Hope you brought your Bibles this morning. We'll be, we'll be in those. Hope you have a pen this morning. You'll need those. Acts chapter 9. And we see here, even before Paul was baptized, there was a vision given to Paul. And it was shared to him by Ananias here in verse 15. But the Lord said to Ananias, Go, this man is my chosen instrument to carry my name before the Gentiles and their kings and before the people of Israel. I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. Now, now, this is very interesting text because this is the destiny of Paul. This is what God has in store for him, but only if he accepts the gospel of Jesus Christ. Wow. See, it's really interesting. He was called to evangelize the Gentiles, their kings, and also the people of Israel. Evangelizing really just means to spread the good news. Amen. So he was called to go spread the good news amongst the world. And we see right here that God chose him to be a, his instrument to spread that good news. And God says in verse 16, I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. Which leads us to our first point, evangelizing brings suffering. Oh. Pretty ironic that spreading the good news would bring suffering. That doing something good would bring hardship. Pretty ironic. But we understand that the first uh, Paul's first missionary journey covers the chapters of 13 and 14 in the book of Acts. His second missionary journey is from the middle of 15 to 18. Uh, third is 18 to 21. And some people would call this last section is Paul's fourth missionary journey, chapters 21 to 28. We will pick up here in chapter 21. And here we come up to Acts chapter 21. And Paul has come to see James and the apostles there in Jerusalem. And he shares all the awesome good news that is being done among the Gentiles. I think what's really cool is that we got to hear Shauna share about all the great things that God is doing amongst the disciples in L.A. and Jerusalem, right? Yeah, but I think what was even more encouraging is that when Paul gets there to hang out with James, James shares all the thousands of good news about the thousands of Jews that have become Christians there in Jerusalem. Yeah. Right? It's kind of like coming up here to hang out with Brian and Joel and hear about all the good news, all the yeah. people that are praying to know God. Come right? on, it's great right? just to share in that partnership, but to have that good news. Yeah. We will pick up here in verse 27. And in verse 27, it, it reads, When the seven days were nearly over, some Jews from the province of Asia saw Paul at the temple. They stirred up the whole crowd and seized them, shouting, Men of Israel, help us! This is the man who teaches all men everywhere against our people and our law in this place. And besides, he has brought Greece into the temple area and defiled this holy place. They had previously seen Trophimus and the Ephesian in the city with Paul and assumed that Paul had brought him into the temple area. Well, bottom line here, guys, we learned that, hey, you probably shouldn't assume, right? Y'all know what assuming does. But bottom line is, Paul didn't bring any Gentiles into the temple. The Jews falsely assumed it, right? But what you see here is, like always, wherever Paul went, persecution followed him. The poisoning just followed Paul as he strived to spread the good news amongst this world. Verse 30. The whole city was aroused, and the people came running from all directions. Seizing Paul, they dragged him from the temple, and immediately the gates were shut. While they were trying to kill him, news reached the commander of the Roman troops that the whole city of Jerusalem was in an uproar. He at once took some officers and soldiers and ran down to the crowd. When the riders saw the commander and the soldiers, they stopped beating Paul. So right here, in fact, you see Paul's rescued by the Romans. He's rescued by the Gentiles. Wow. 
And I think it's very interesting to see that Paul was actually rescued by the people he's calling to save. Right? And he has that heart. Now, now he's got more of a heart to him. I really kind of want to save these Gentiles, right? They <laughs> saved my life. Right? But the amazing thing here is that you see that an uproar occurred all because of falsely accusations. False accusations. Come on. And very interesting, you think like when people are making fun of you or saying all bad things about you and they're not true, the last thing they're going to want to do is pop to you. <laughs> Paul turns to the commander and he's like, hey, hey, sir, I would like to speak to these people. Right. Right? He turns and he speaks to them. And now what's very interesting is about in Luke notes, two times, once in verse 20 of this chapter and the second in chapter 22 of verse 1, Paul doesn't speak to them in Greek. He doesn't speak to them into Latin. He doesn't speak to them in Hebrew. He speaks to them in what is called Hebraic dialectos, which is Aramaic. That was the common language of the time. So by doing this, by sharing that common language, Paul said, hey, I'm one of you. I'm just like you guys. I know you don't like me right now, but I'm just like you. We, were in, we have everything in common. And you see, he starts to share his conversion story, which we all should be semi-familiar with, in chapter 22. Come on. Chapter 22 and verse 6, we'll pick up. And it reads, About noon as I came near Damascus, suddenly a bright light from heaven flashed around me. I fell to the ground and heard a voice say to me, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who, who are you, Lord, I asked? I am Jesus of Nazareth, whom you are persecuting, he replied. My companions saw the light. They did not understand the voice of him who was speaking to me. What shall I do, Lord, I asked? Get up, the Lord said, and go into Damascus. There you will be told all you have been assigned to do. Wow. I think this is absolutely incredible. Can you imagine putting yourself into Paul's feet right here? Into his, his sandals? Right? Like, just, just picture this. You're walking down the road. A bright light comes and you're blind. Then you hear a deep voice from the sky. If I was Paul, I'd be screaming, oh, Lord, oh, Lord, too. Like, it better be God. I don't know what's going on right now, but it's better be God. Right? And, and he's like, man, he's terrified right now. But it gets his attention. I think that could be many of us today. That you wait until your deathbed. You wait till some tragic situation to get serious with God. Yeah. Right? What are you going to make God do in your life to start taking this seriously? Wow. Start taking this Christian walk seriously. To get fully committed. I also find it very interesting that in verse 10, he says, go in to be, do everything you've been assigned to do. Wow. He says assigned. Right? When you're assigned to do something, you're expected to get it done. Right? Yeah. Is any student, do we have any college students in the house? Oh. When you're given homework, you're expected to get it done. Yeah. Right. You go to work, you get a job to do, you're expected to get it done. Yeah. Right? You have chores at home for those households, sisters' households, kids. Oh. You're expected to get those chores done, right? Yeah. And then when you're assigned to do something, you're expected to get it done. Yeah. Now think, what has God assigned you to do this morning? Wow. What has God called you to? And are you striving to get it done? We'll read on in verse 12. This is a man named Ananias came to see me. He was a devout observer of the law and highly respected by all the Jews living there. You see, what, what, what Paul's doing here is relating to the people he's sharing with. He's like, hey, this guy Ananias, which you all like, all the Jews like him. This guy Ananias, he came and talked to me about God. All right, so you guys are friends with him, just want to let you know. Read on. Verse 13, he stood beside me and said, Brother Saul, receive your son. And at that very moment, I was able to see him. Then he said, the God of our fathers has chosen you to know his will and to see the righteous one and hear the words from his mouth. Again, he's doing it again. The God of our fathers. Like, I'm one of you. We're, we're the same. The same God. Wow. That's who's coming. Wow. Right? Verse 15. You will be his witness to all men, what you have seen and heard. See, Paul was always called to evangelize the world. That was the command of God. Amen, church? Amen. Verse 16. And now what are you waiting for? Get up, be baptized, and wash your sins away, calling on his name. Amen. You know, it's interesting. Paul had to kind of be pushed into the waters. Right? Did anyone study the Bible and kind of need an extra push to get to the waters? Yeah, some of us, right? Some of us are studying right now, and we kind of need that push to the waters, right? Right? And But you have to ask your question, yourself that question. If you're studying the Bible this morning, what are you waiting for? Get up, be baptized, right? Baptism is when your sins are washed away. It's clear, Acts 2.38. Yeah. Right? It's when your sins are washed away. You may have never participated in a New Testament baptism, but I encourage you to study the Bible if you have. Yeah. Understand what that is about. Yeah. And get to know God. Even some, some are here this morning that need to be restored, or spiritually need to be woken up. And yet I challenge you to answer this question. What are you waiting for? 
What are you waiting for? Come on, bro. See, Paul knew he didn't deserve to know God. And it took a lot of humility for him to know that and to say that. It took a lot of humility for him to be strong in the grace for Paul to get to the point of being baptized. Why? Because for him to go get baptized is stating that, hey, everything I've been doing up to this point isn't wrong. Wow. My life that I've been living wouldn't get me to heaven. So now I need to repent and go get baptized. See, I believe that's what holds a lot of the people back today to get right with God. Yeah. Is their pride. They're afraid to admit that, you know what, I've been wrong. I've been wrong in the past. Yeah. True. They don't want to say, you know what, I, I, I don't really have a true relationship with God according to God. Right? They're afraid to say, you know, up to this point I've been wrong. And they end up thinking that, you know what, God owes me something. You know, God owes me something. Right? And I don't, I'm not really broken by my sin, but God owes me. You know? But I'm all honesty, guys. If God came back today and asked you, what are you waiting for? Like, what are you waiting for on keeping your feelings and your emotions second to God's word? Wow. What are you waiting for to just do that? Do you think any excuse is going to be good enough? No. No. Nope. You'd be like, but, but, but. No. Right? <laughs> you know? You'd be searching for anything, but nothing. Just, why not just start now? Why not just be fully committed yeah. and all in? But you got to think, what's the difference today? If Jesus came back and said that to you personally, why not just go after it right now? Amen. We need to remember that even some who say, Lord, Lord, Jesus will respond. Away from me, you will do. Let's pick up in verse 17. When I returned to Jerusalem and was praying at the temple, I fell into a trance and saw the Lord speaking. Quick, he said, leave Jerusalem immediately because they will not accept your testimony about me. Lord, I replied, these men know that I went from one synagogue to another to imprison and beat those who believe in me. And when the blood of the martyr Stephen was shed, I stood there giving my approval and guarding the clothes of those who were killing him. Then the Lord said to me, go. I will send you far away to the Gentiles. Wow. And Paul just had a radical conversion. <laughs> like this guy used to go around killing Christians, and now he's a Christian. Wow. Right? Talk about radical. But Paul's saying, like, God's like, hey, I want to send you far away. And Paul's like, God, these people, these are my people. These are my people. <laughs> right? they, they know me. They know I used to go around and kill all the Christians. <laughs> they, 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 me preaching your name would probably be really impactful. Yeah. And God's like, no. Go. He says, Paul, the door is closed, but the window is open for you to go to the Gentiles. Wow. Mm -hmm. See, sometimes as disciples, we can see doors close in our lives, and we want to sit there and self pity. Mm -hmm. We want to sit there and just be like, why? Why, God? I thought that was the only way. And that was the door. That was the door. Yeah. Right? On, and you're not looking around for the window that God is open for. Come on. And a lot of us are like, window? <laughs> Who are you going to use a window for? <laughs> God is always showing us where to go, but sometimes it's through suffering and the places we would never think about going. Yeah. Right? We got to hear from Malik and Green. You see, there's some hardships, some suffering, yeah. and some places they never thought they'd be going. Yeah. But God, God's using those things to train them. I never thought I'd be in the middle of the desert in Antelope Valley. <laughs> Antelope Valley is not like LA or everyone thinks. It's no. high desert. There's Really, there's not like there's like a section of grass. There's no water. So it's just it. You get the, the, the high times and everything. It's, a, it's like the worst of the worst. It's really cold, but you get no snow. It's really hot, and you have a beach. It's just, I never thought I'd be there. But it was the window that God opened for me in my life. What windows are God opening in your life that you need to start looking through? Let's pick up verse 22. The crowd listened to Paul until he said this. Then they raised their voices and shouted, Rip the earth of him! He's not fit to live. As they were shouting and throwing off their cloaks and flinging dust into the air, the commander ordered Paul to be taken into the barracks. He directed that he be flogged and questioned in order to find out why the people were shouting at him like this. As they stretched him out to flog him, Paul said to the centurion standing there, uh, Is it legal for you to flog your own citizen who hasn't even been found guilty? <laughs> when the centurion heard this, he went to the commander and ordered, what are you going to do, he asked. This man is a Roman citizen. The commander went to Paul and asked, tell me, are you a Roman citizen? Yes, I am, he answered. Then the commander said, I had to pay a big price for my citizenship, but I was born a citizen, Paul replied. Those who were about to question him withdrew immediately. The commander himself was alarmed when he realized that he had put Paul, a Roman citizen, in chains. Wow. See, up to this point, Paul's already been flogged before. Paul's like, I'm not doing that one again. <laughs> I'm holding the Roman citizen card, all right? I'm not going through that one more time. But you see, but Paul was born. 
born a Roman citizen. Nope. This is what God made him. Why? Why did God make him that? To fulfill his God-given destiny. God had made him, had made him a Roman citizen for an exact reason. He was born in his exact time and place for the destiny God has called him. You ever wonder why the color of your skin is the way it is? Why? You ever wonder why you're not just five inches taller? <laughs> My wife does that all the time. <laughs> Have you ever wondered why you're, you're, you were born in a certain place? Like, why? Why in the middle of Oregon? <laughs> why was I born here? Right? It's because God has woken your DNA and made it exactly perfect to the destiny He is calling wow. everyone. Yeah. How come I couldn't be five inches taller? Why can't I just look a little different? Right? Because if He made you any different, you'd be too prideful to become a disciple. You wouldn't be sitting here this morning. Come on. So when you look in the mirror later today, look at yourself and imagine the destiny which God has before you. Amen. That He wants to use you to change this world. Uh -huh. To change you, Gene. But then you find the centurion, he's a bit confused. And he said, Man, why all this uproar about Paul? What's up with this random guy, Paul? Right? So he takes him to San Diego and he wants to find out what's going on. We'll pick up in Acts chapter 23. Nice. Come on, on, Verse 1. Paul looked straight at the Sandy and he said, My brothers, I have fulfilled my duty to God in all good conscience to this day. At this, the high priest Ananias ordered those standing near Paul to strike him on the mouth. Then Paul said to him, God will strike you, you whitewashed wall. You sit there to judge me according to the law, yet you yourselves violate the law by commanding that I be struck. Those who were standing near Paul said, You dare insult God's high priest? Paul replied, Brothers, I did not realize I was the high priest. For it was written, Do not speak evil about the ruler of your people. Pretty incredible, huh? And I'm like, oops. Like, I, I didn't, oops. Right? Right here, you see, Paul was a man of deep conviction. Yeah. He just had deep conviction. So when he was unrighteously slapped, he was like, what the heck are you doing, you whitewashed wall? <laughs> the brothers there were like, man, this is getting a little iffy. Like, dude, that's the, that's the high priest, bro. <laughs> what are you doing? Right? He goes, oh, I, I did not realize. And I think it's very incredible. You see the, the example Paul sets here? Yeah. Is he apologizes right away. Wow. How many of us, when our sin gets pointed out, we just want a defense? Yeah. 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 Right? We want to put it back on people? Right away, you know what? Right. I was wrong. He quotes the scripture that he, that he disobeyed, Exodus 22, 28. And, and it's really cool, but you notice his apology doesn't compromise his convictions about the truth. Yeah. He apologizes, and you know what? I'm saying I'm wrong. I apologize. But this is still not what's supposed to go down. <laughs> this is, you know, this isn't right. He's willing to admit when he was wrong, and he wasn't going to give in to the persecutors and those attacking his basic convictions. Wow. Right? You with me here, church? Yeah. See, about two weeks ago was the election day for the United States of America. Wow. The president was voted in. One in which people are saddened by, and one that people are extremely excited about. Whichever one you are, it doesn't bother me. I don't care. We all have the right to our personal choice in that area. But as Christians, guys... That's as far as it goes. Yeah, come on, bro. It's your own personal decision. Yeah. Personal meaning it's your alone choice. Some of us want to post the great things about the president on social media. Some of us want to post the great things about the opposite party on social media. Guys, either way, one, it's not unifying. Yeah. It starts to cause different groups and growth that grow in the church. Yeah. Right? A church that should neither have Jews nor Greeks, slave nor free. We should be one body functioning as a family. And now you want to have Democrats and Republicans. Right? Yeah. And two, you become a stumbling rock to your own brothers and sisters. Yeah. It's better to have a millstone around your neck and jump into the ocean. Yeah. Pretty serious. Yeah. Right? I'll read this one to you. Romans 13, 1 through 5. It reads, Everyone must submit himself to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except that which God has established. Yeah. The authorities that exist have been established by God. Yeah. Consequently, he who rebels against the authority <coughs> is rebelling against God and what God has instituted. Those who do so will bring judgment on themselves. See, I think some of us will get to judgment day and be shocked that God actually meant what he said in his word. Oh. Wait, you really meant that? Like, I really had to obey my government authorities? Like, you were serious 100%? Like, it was Trump. Dude, come on. No, God was serious. You really meant I had to become a disciple? Like, yeah. Like, God is serious in his word. Come on, bro. We've got to take it very seriously. Come on, man. See, some of us say I wanted Clinton because she's just a better person. She's just a nice lady. Mm -hmm. Guys, they're both in this world. 
They both are in the darkness. Since when did a little sin become better than a lot of sin? Sin is sin. A little more will separate you from God. They both have an equal chance to become disciples, but the question is, have you prayed for that? Wow. Or have you only wow. complained about that? Wow. It's either you've prayed or you've complained. Wow. Wow. What have you been doing Ooh. for your years? Wow. See, I've seen more political posts in the last few days from some people that I've never seen them on Facebook. <laughs> <laughs> but some of you need to take that same passion and put it towards our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Come on, you want to see America great again? You want to see this world great again? We need to go make disciples. Yeah. Here. 
But when the son of Paul's sister heard of this plot, he went into the barracks and told Paul. Then Paul called one of the centurions and said, Take this young man to the commander. He has something to tell him. So he took him to the commander. The centurion said, Paul, uh, said, Paul the prisoner sent for me and asked me to bring this young man to you because he has something to tell you. The commander took the young man by the hand, drew him aside, and asked, What is it you want to tell me? He said, The Jews have agreed to ask you to bring Paul before the same agent of on the pretext of wanting more accurate information about him. Don't give it to them, because more than 40 of them are waiting in ambush for him. They have taken an oath not to eat or drink until they have killed him. They're already out, waiting for your consent to their request. The commander dismissed the young man and cautioned him. Don't tell anyone that you have reported this to me. You know, we, we have a very fascinating piece of insight here from Paul. And, and what's interesting is it's Paul's nephew. It, it's his sister's son's physical nephew that finds out about the plot to kill Paul. Right? Some ask, well, did, did his nephew become a Christian? Well, in my opinion, no, not at this time. You may say, why? Well, because usually throughout the scriptures, you see, if they became a Christian, their names would be mentioned in the scriptures. Mm -hmm. He those names here. Well, for an example here, you can turn with me to Romans 16. Come on, man. Come on, In Romans 16, Paul saying his greetings to the brothers and sisters in Rome. And in verse 7, it says, Greet Adrosius and Junius, my relatives who have been in prison with me. They are outstanding among the apostles. And they were in Christ before I was. See, Paul had family become Christians before he became a Christian. Oh, wow. And it's most likely that, that it could be very well where his, his zeal for persecution came from. Because isn't it true? It's usually our immediate families yeah. that bring the worst persecution at first. Oh, wow. right? And Paul, Paul says, you know what? My family were Christians even before I was. But you see that their names were mentioned here. As a matter of fact, they were mentioned because they were suffering in prison with Paul. And so the silence of his nephew's name most likely means that he was yet to become a Christian. And something else that we can lean towards that direction is that you may wonder, like, well, his nephew heard about the plot to kill Paul, right? Probably wouldn't be a plot that would be shared amongst the Christians. <laughs> like, hey guys, just let you know we're going to kill your new Paul. Right? No, if there was a Christian amongst them, they wouldn't have shared the, the plot. Yeah. But his nephew heard about the plot because he was amongst the Jews. So most likely he was yet to be a Christian. Uh, but when he found out that Uncle Paul was in a lot of trouble, he went running to his rescue, right? He's the one that gets the commander and spills everything. Verse 23 of Acts 23. You guys with me? Verse 23 reads, Then he called two of his and ordered them, Get ready a detachment of 200 soldiers, 70 horsemen, and 200 spearmen to go to Caesarea at night tonight. Provide mounts for Paul so that he may be taken safely to the governor Felix. He wrote a letter as follows, follows Claudius Lysias to his excellent governor Felix. Greetings. This man was seized by the Jews and they were about to kill him. But I came in with my troops and rescued him. For I had learned that he was a Roman citizen. I wanted to know why they were accusing him, so I brought him to the Sanhedrin. I found that the accusation had to do with questions about their law. But there was no charge against him that deserved death or imprisonment. When I was informed of a plot to be carried out against the man, I sent him to you at once. I also ordered his accusers to be present to you their case against him. See, it's kind of interesting. That's not really exactly how it worked out. No. Right? Kind of, kind of twisted up a little bit. He's like, hey, uh, you know, I saw this guy. He's getting beaten. I, I knew he was a Roman citizen. So I kind of swooped in. It was that, hey, uh, he was getting attacked. I went to go flog him. And then I realized he was a Roman citizen. <laughs> he didn't want to tell that part of the story, though, did he? See, that, that's exactly what the world is. Yeah. They like to twist the truth to make them sound just as, as good as they can. Yeah. Right? It's even what the religious world does today. Mm -hmm. Many denominations came about and were established because basic Christianity, the, the biblical Christianity, became boring to them because they didn't understand it. Wow. So they twist the truth just a little bit to make it more exciting. Wow. And this is exciting. Right? And they start to twist the truth. Wow. I'm grateful to be part of a movement that doesn't twist the truth. Yeah. Come on, man. See, as disciples, we are what we are. I'm a mess without God, guys. You knew me back in Boston? Weird. I'm a mess. But you see, we still love one another. Why? Well, one, because it's commanding after one. But two, because it's the blood of Christ, because He first loved us. Yeah. And He learned to love one another. Is there anybody you have conflict with in the body? Anyone you just don't feel right with this morning? You need to get right with them today. The Bible says quite clearly in 1 John, if you can't love your brother who you've seen, how can you possibly love your God who you haven't seen? Wow. Come on. 
Right here, I find it very interesting that God uses Claudius Lysias in a powerful way. When he hears that Paul is about to be assassinated, he says, hey, we need to get this guy out of Governor Felix. We've got to protect this guy. So he calls two centurions in. He has 200 soldiers, 70 horsemen, 200 spearmen. Talk about some cool protection, huh? Yeah. This guy's got like a, a swat on his back just to go down to Rome. <laughs> and he's a prisoner, right? That's awesome. But I think what's really interesting is you see that no matter what, when you're a Christian, when you surrender to God, he's always going to protect you. Yeah. No matter what situation. Oh. You may be in the deepest of hardships, and he's always going to protect you. Yeah. Right? Here's the conviction that we all need to have. In evangelizing, and that's what disciples do, that's our purpose, amen? Right? In evangelizing and spreading the good news, it will bring suffering. Physically, emotionally, financially, Paul had nothing, right? And even spiritually, it will have a hit in our lives. Yeah. But you got to ask yourself, is my faith, is my life, is my doctrine even worthy of persecution? Wow. wow. You know, some who call themselves disciples in the past were heavily persecuted and are no longer persecuted. You say, how come? Well, now it's because they want, they, they're afraid of bringing conflict with the truth, so they just want to say peace, peace to the world. Yeah. I, don't wanna, I, don't, I don't want to tell the truth because sometimes it hurts people. Mm -hmm. And so it's better to lie to them. Mm -hmm. There's a study, you can look it up, that 90% of the world would rather you lie to as long as it wouldn't hurt them. Wow. <laughs> That's just the world we live in. And so when they hit, they hit with the truth and it hurts, they want to run. But how about it? Are you willing to suffer even through persecution because you love your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength? Come on, bro. Right. Come on. Paul did, and I believe you do as well. Amen? Amen. Point number two, evangelizing brings kings. Yes! Woo. Even kings need the Lord Jesus. Amen. You guys remember in Acts 9 where God uses Ananias to tell Paul he was going to go to the Gentiles and then their kings and the oh, Jews? Yeah. Right? Of course, remember the strategy of Paul that he would, the, from the command of God that he would first go to the Jews, then to the Gentiles? And this is what exactly what we see here. First he went to the Jewish, Jewish leaders, and now he's being sent to the Romish, uh, the Romish Roman leaders. Right? And it's interesting that here in chapter 23, Paul has just finished evangelizing the most powerful Jewish leaders. Now God's going to take Paul to evangelize some of the power, most powerful Gentile leaders. In chapter 24, verse 1. Come on. Five days later, the high priest Ananias went down to Caesarea with some of the elders and a lawyer named Trulius, and they brought their charges against Paul before the governor. When Paul was called in, Trulius presented his case before Felix. We have enjoyed a long period of peace under you, and your foresight has brought about reforms in this nation. Everywhere in every way, most excellent uh, Felix, we acknowledge this with, with a profound gratitude. But in order not to worry you further, I would request that you would be kind enough to hear us briefly. We have found this man to be a troublemaker, stirring out riots among the Jews all over the world. He is a ringleader of the Nazarene sect. And he tried to desecrate the temple, so we seized him. Wow. Right? So we see at this point the plan to kill Paul has kind of failed. So those 40 guys are probably a little hungry right now. Oh. Oops, right? It's probably an oath they wrote. But now the reason Luke cites the, the, hey, the Greek lawyer to Julius, I believe the reason he's mentioned to show how serious this is. How serious they wanted to hurt Paul. Yeah. Like this lawyer would cost thousands of dollars. Lots of money back in the day. And they were willing to raise it just to hurt Paul. How much more for us to just raise it to evangelize this part? Right. right? We read on verse 22. The commander dismissed the young man. Oh, wrong chapter. Nice, nice book, wrong chapter. No, awesome. Chapter 22. Then Felix, who was well acquainted with the way, adjoined the proceedings. When Lysias, the commander, comes, he said, I will decide your case. He ordered the centurion to keep Paul under guard, but to give him some freedom and permit his friends to take care of his needs. That's nice. Several days later, Felix came with his wife, Drusilla, who was a Jewess. He sent for Paul and listened to him as he spoke about faith in Christ Jesus. As Paul discoursed on righteousness, self-control, and the judgment to come, Felix was afraid and said, That's enough for now. You may leave. When I find it convenient, I will send for you. At that same time, he was hoping that Paul would offer him a bride, so he, he sent for him frequently and talked with him. When two years had passed, Felix was succeeded by Porcius Festus. But because Felix wanted to grant a favor to the Jews, he left Paul in prison. Wow. Right here, we meet Governor Felix, well-known in that day. But what's interesting is he married a more well-known woman of the day, Drusilla. As the Bible says, she was a Jewess. But interestingly, she was one of the three famous daughters of Herod and the I. Now, who was Herod and the I? That was the guy in Acts 12 who beheads James and is eaten by worms. Yeah. And how's that for that? Interesting, Father. Oh, 
So Cephas, the noted Jewish historian, writes, she indeed exceeded all women in beauty. Wow. And you make the record books for your beauty. It's some good luck. Right? <laughs> Interestingly enough, though, we know from history, she was married at 14. Felix takes her away from that husband and marries her. So now you're getting to kind of understand the text a little more. But at this point, she's 19 years old, and she's hearing all about Paul in the way. Right? She knows who her dad was and how he beheaded uh, uh, James here, John. And, and she, he goes, okay, I've heard about this way before. My dad had something to do with it. Now I'm hearing about him again at age 19. Wow. As I said before, she was pretty famous, and her two sisters, Mary and Bernice, and we'll talk about Bernice here in just a little bit. But her father, so her father was Herod Agrippa I, who killed James. Her great uncle was the one who beheaded John the Baptist. Her great grandpa, Herod the Great, was the one who had all the babies killed in Act 2, which was known as slaughter of the innocent. Wow. Talk about a nice, like, awkward Thanksgiving dinner, huh? Wow. You're afraid of who you're going to hug because you don't know if they're going to take you out. Right? But that was the family lineage. Like, that was like, hey, these are my grandparents. These are my dad. It's my uncle. Like, this is just, we have nothing to do with this way. And so you see right here when Jerusalem Felix was listening to Paul and his discourse about righteousness, self-control, and the judgment to come, he's getting a little afraid. He's like, I don't want to hear this anymore. Right? Because that's enough. I'll send for you when the time's convenient. Mm -hmm. The truth is, time's never convenient to be right. Never convenient. Right. I lived an hour and a half away from the church in Boston. Yeah. I was expected to make it every meeting but I drove an hour and a half, four days a week. I spent eight hundred dollars in gas a month. Because I needed to be at the kingdom of God. Was it convenient? Absolutely not. <laughs> But somebody saw that that was more important for my salvation than for me to be communion. Amen. I think it holds us back from sharing our faith because we're afraid to be inconvenienced people in their life. Guys, it's going to be inconvenienced when they go to hell. Yeah. Awesome. We need to be the one that steps in and makes it convenient to get them to heaven. Amen? Amen. Amen. But, so we find Bob line, two years pass, and he's never, Paul's never released from prison. Another governor comes in, Felix did a bad job, so he's taken out. Gordius Festus, who's recorded as an incredibly good man, becomes the governor. Which is interesting because he reigns for th three years only and suffers an untimely death. But it's interesting that he, he reigns at just a proper time that overlaps as Paul's in prison. God determines every time and place and every leader that's in charge. But let's pick up here and see what reads on. Chapter 25, verse 1. Three days after arriving in the province of Festus, Festus went up to Caesarea to Jerusalem, where the chief priests and Jewish leaders appeared before and presented their charges against Paul. They urgently requested Festus as a favor to them to have Paul transferred to Jerusalem, for they were preparing an ambush to kill him along the way. Verse 9. Festus, wishing to do the Jews a favor, said to Paul, Are you willing to go up to Jerusalem and stand trial before me there on these charges? Paul answered, I am now standing before Caesar's court, where I ought to be tried. I have not done any wrong to the Jews, as you yourselves know very well. If, however, I am guilty of doing anything deserving that, I do not refuse to die. But if the charges brought against me by these Jews are not true, no one has the right to hand me over to them. I appeal to Caesar. After Festus had conferred with his counsel, he declared, You have appealed to Caesar? To Caesar you will go. See, Paul figured it out. If I go to Jerusalem, I'm going to die. But as a Roman citizen, I have this, 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 this right to claim to go before Caesar. Right? But I think Paul here in his mind is like, Baby, this is my ticket to Rome. Wow. This is how I'm going to get to the most influential city. Wow. This is my plan. I want to evangelize the world. And this is how God's going to let me do it. Wow. See, now he also figured out that not only was he being taken to the most influential city, but he was going to meet the most influential man at the time, wow. Caesar. Wow. Pretty awesome, huh? Yeah. Verse 13, it says, A few days later, King Agrippa and Bernice arrived at Caesarea to pay their respects to the Festus. So now you got King Agrippa and Bernice, right? They were so fired up with Festus coming in that, that the king of the, he was the king of the whole area, so they're excited. Right? King Agrippa II, this is the son of the guy who beheaded John and was eaten by worms. But this is also the brother of Drusilla, Mary Ann Bernice. And, and it's once more, it's the women who are more famous in this time. Bernice again was known in the Roman world as the most beautiful woman of the time. So now you got two sisters known as the most beautiful women, one for the Gentile side and one for the Roman side. It's a good looking family, huh? <laughs> But sadly, as you can see right here, King Agrippa and her had a relationship. King Agrippa and her were brother and sister. And she was widowed two times before she hooked up with her brother. And right here, she was only 31 years old and her brother was 32. But her fame comes many more years later 
When, when she's taken from her brother, from no, none other than General Titus, who was the generally destroyed and annihilated Jerusalem in 70 AD. He comes in and takes Bernice, and, and he takes her to Rome, and Rome, who were, they were known as heathens, right? They actually looked down upon Bernice, because she ended, they never ended up being married, Bernice and uh, Titus. And he ends up just putting her to the side, very sad. But we see, well, what happened? What, what happens next in verse 23? Wow. The next day, Agrippa and Bernice came with great pomp and entered the audience room with the high-ranking officers and the leading men of the city. At the command of Festus, Paul was brought in. Wow, this is kind of cool here. Festus has asked King Agrippa, hey, Paul's kind of being charged with some weak charges. Can you come in and hear him out and just kind of help me form some charges against them before we send him out? Right? But Paul's being brought before them, and check this, he's being brought before the high-ranking officers and the leading men of the city. Paul's pretty fired up at this moment. Right? He, he's not thinking, hey, I'm in jail, I'm going to go to prison for longer. He's thinking, dude, I need to share with these famous people right now. This is pretty sweet. These are the high-ranking officials. These are the most influential people of the time. Right? And as Destiny would say, he's getting to preach to the governors and now the kings. Verse, chapter 26, let's move on. Chapter 26, verse 19. We'll pick up at Paul's defense. So then, King Agrippa, I was not disobedient to the vision from heaven, first to those in Damascus, then to those in Jerusalem, and all Judea, and to the Gentiles also. I preached that they should repent and turn to God, and prove their repentance by their deeds. That, it, that is why the Jews seized me in the temple courts and tried to kill me. But I, I have had God's help in this very day. And so I stand here and testify to the small and great alike. I am saying nothing beyond what the prophet of Moses said, Moses said would happen, that the Christ would come and suffer. And as the first to rise from the dead, we proclaim light to his own people and to the Gentiles. At this point, Festus interrupted Paul's defense. You are out of your mind, Paul. He shouted, your, your great learning is driving you insane. See, it's because he was a Roman, his Roman mindset, he's thinking, how could there be a resurrection? Like, that just doesn't make sense. Right? Verse 25. I am not insane, most excellent. Festus replied, or Festus, Paul replied, what I am saying is true and reasonable. The king is familiar with these things, and I can speak freely to him. I am convinced that none of this has escaped his notice, because it was not done in the corner. King Agrippa, do you believe the prophets? I know you do. <laughs> then Agrippa said to Paul, do you think that in such a short time you can persuade me to be a Christian? Paul replied, short time along. I pray that, I pray God that not only you, but all who are listening to me may become what I am, except for these chains. He goes, I know you do. I know you're a Jew. I know you believe in what I'm talking about right now. Right? Keep reading, close out that chapter. He says, Then the king rose with him, the governor of Greece, and those sitting with them. They left the room, and while talking with one another, they said, This man has not done anything wrong that deserves death or imprisonment. Agrippa said to Festus, This man could have been set free if, it had not appealed, if he had not appealed to Caesar. See, Luke just underlines it again and again all through the book of Acts. Paul did nothing wrong but proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ. That was his mission, that was his heart, that's everything he did. You see, and you might say, why? Why did he share his faith with these people? They were heathens. They were Jews that weren't open to learning about Jesus. Why? I believe the secret's here in 1 Timothy. Come on, bro. Come on, bro. This is awesome. You guys ready? Yeah. Come on, bro. I'll let that turkey get you. 1 Timothy chapter 1. <laughs> chapter 1, verse 13. We're going to get moving here. Even though I was once a blasphemer and persecutor and a violent man, I was shown mercy because I acted in ignorance and unbelief. The grace of our Lord was poured out on me abundantly, along with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. Here is a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the worst. But for that very reason, I was shown mercy, so that in me, the worst of sinners, Christ Jesus, might display his unlimited patience as an example for those who would believe on me and receive eternal life. See, in everyday language, Paul's saying right here, hey, if I can become a Christian, anyone can become a Christian. Yeah. Right? He saw himself as the worst. He saw himself worse than King Agrippa, worse than Bernice who married each other. He said, I'm worse than these people. Right? And that's why he preached with such conviction. Wow. To the governors, the officers, and to the kings, he believed they could change. Mm. Do you have people in your life that you just don't think could change? Wow. That you don't know if they could really become Christians? Maybe you need to reconsider who you were before you became Christian. Right? Yeah. Because to many people, you were the impossible convert. See, so, yeah, I, I, we don't have time for it, but I was going to share a story, but really not. I was met, but uh, very quickly, uh, Shauna became, we, we dated in the world. Shauna became a Christian in Hawaii. I thought she lost her mind. She was a little crazy. Uh, ten months later, I become a Christian in Boston. Wow. 
Um, and, 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 but it was, that was her impossible prayer. Just praying for me. Yeah. Just just fighting in prayer that, hey, Christ didn't become a Christian. I just want his soul to be saved. Mm-hmm. Then I was within an hour after I to the church. And I can any friends become Christians? Like, I live so far away. I'm the only one. I'm new. I don't know if anyone can become Christians. <laughs> then we started baptizing our friends. Mike, Peter, Jackie, Tim. Like, people just started making it. I'm like, oh, it's possible. Wow. It was really cool. I could be the, the campus ministry at UCLA for about six months. And during that time, I would play some pickup basketball for fun. But we had to meet Deshaun Jackson, the what? professional NFL player. He walks on the court. We only had four on our team, and we're like, hey, we need one. Deshaun's like, yeah, I'll play. Pick up Deshaun Jackson. And it was so cool. But, but to the world, that's like a king. To the world, this famous guy. And we got to share our faith with him. Yeah. And bottom up, I got a real funny story. I thought he called me, but it was a brother that called me. I was super excited. I was still excited that it was a brother, amen. Uh, amen. Amen. Uh, but, but why? Why do you share with these people? Like, why? Because if I can become a Christian, if you can become a Christian, then anyone can become a Christian. Come on, bro. See, evangelizing brings kings. Spreading the news, the good news brings kings. But even good even kings need the good news. Yeah. Point number three, we're closing out. Evangelizing brings adventure. See, spreading the good news brings adventure. Right? Now I got a scripture I want you guys to memorize. John 3, verse 8. It says, The wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it is going. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. You know, anybody that wants to plot out their own life, action by action, they're not a disciple. Wow. They don't want to get blown out of the wind. They don't want to live by the Spirit. Wow. Right? A true disciple is blown by the wind. And of course the words wind and spirit in the Greek are one and the same. And so Jesus is making a bit of play on words right here. That a true disciple, it doesn't, he doesn't know where he's going. He doesn't know where she's going. Because he doesn't know where the spirit's going to blow them. Right? Acts chapter 27, verse 1. When it was decided that we would sail for Italy, Paul and some other prisoners were handed over to the centurion named Julius. He belonged to the imperial regiment. We boarded a ship from Atorium. About, about to sail for ports along the coast of the province of Asia, and we put out to sea. Atrisius, a Macedonian from the Thessalonica, was with us. The next day, we landed at Sidian, and Julius, in kindness to Paul, allowed him to go to his friends so that they may provide for his needs. From there, we put out to sea again and passed through the Lee of Cyprus because the winds were against us. When we had sailed across the open sea of the coast of Sicilia and Pamphylia, we landed at Myra in Lycia. We're going to stop right here at Myra. I think what's really interesting, for just for a moment, in the late 3rd and early 4th centuries, the Christian leader in Europe was a man called St. Nicholas. Now, in the Netherlands, he would, of course, was called Santa Claus. In America, we know him as Santa Claus. Yeah. See, he was a martyr, he, or he was martyred, but he was a legend that arose about his gallant leadership during the Middle Ages, right? Figured because it's almost Christmas we can talk about this. <laughs> but there, there was evidently a very poor man in that town. He had nothing. He had nothing but his three daughters, right? And so because he had nothing to eat, nothing for them to, to eat, he, he in turn decided to sell them into slavery, prostitution. Uh, and however, when Nicholas heard about this, he goes to all the brothers and sisters of the church. He collects as much money as they can. In a very poor church, he collects as much money as he can. And he puts it into three different bags, right? And he divides the money up, and, and, and he wants the generosity of the people fill these bags. It was incredible. But, so he tries to enter a house, but he doesn't want to go through the door, and he doesn't want to go through the windows, because, well, he doesn't want to get noticed, and one, he found out that they were locked. Hmm. And, and when, they were, when they were locked, he said, you know what, I'm going to drop them down the chimney. And legend goes that when he would drop them, they would miraculously hit the floor and bounce them through the stockings. The girls had just finished washing. So now you know where Christmas has come from. Uh, amen. 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 You can share that at home with us. But it's time to move on. Acts 27, verse 9. Go on. Thanks, bro. Much time had been lost, and sailing had already become dangerous, because by now it was after the fast. So Paul warned them, men, I can see that our voyage is going to be dis- disastrous and bring great loss to the ship and cargo to our own lives also. But the century, instead of listening to what Paul said, followed the advice of the pilot and of the owner of the ship. Since the harbor was unsuitable to winter in it, the majority decided that we should sail on, hoping to reach Phoenix and winter there. This was a harbor and creek facing both southwest and northwest. When a gentle south wind began to blow, they thought they had obtained what they wanted. So they weighed anchor and sailed along the shore of Crete. Before very long, a wind of hurricane force, force called the Northeaster, swept down from the island. The ship was caught up by the storm and could not head into the wind. 
So we gave way to it and were driven along. As we passed through the lead of, the, uh, of a small island called Padia, we were hardly able to make the lifeboat secure. When the men had hoisted it aboard, they passed ropes under the ship itself to hold it together, fearing that they would run aground on the sandbars of the citrus. They lowered the sea anchor and let the ship be driven along. See, now in the older days, the lifeboat was always towed behind the ship. It's just it's how they did it. And, and it was towed along, and so they would pull the lifeboat aboard, in which because it didn't want to activate as an anchor. Can you imagine that, that lifeboat getting filled with water and just totally acting as an anchor? But they pulled it aboard, and they're getting so rough that they pass ropes under the ship, just trying to hold, they're doing anything they can to hold the ship together, right? In verse 17, we read on. Verse 18. We took such a violent battery from the storm, and the next day they began to throw the cargo overboard. On the third day, they threw the ship back overboard with their own hands. When neither sun nor stars appeared for many days, and the storm continued raging, we finally gave up all hope of being saved. After the man had gone a long time without food, Paul stood up before them and said, Men, you should have taken my advice, not to sail from Greek. Then you would have spared your, yourselves this damage and loss. Should have taken my advice. Right? Isn't that just like our brother Paul? Yeah. Here they're at sea, the boat's rocking. They just threw all their stuff overboard. Paul wants to have a little meeting. <laughs> you should have listened to my advice. What did I tell you? Right? Kind of just like stabbing the wound a little worse. But have you ever had your disciples say that to you? Your disciple? Man, you should have listened to my advice. You see, when you don't take advice, you're going to take a lot of damage and loss. Come on, bro. And you see, you see, this is exactly what I'm talking about here. They, they do anything they can. They start passing ropes under the boat to hold their life together. You start doing anything you can to hold your life together because it's going crazy because you didn't feel like listening to advice. It's happened to me a lot. <laughs> Come on, bro. But we read on, and just for time's sake, guys, we're kind of skipping through it. Paul, Paul had guessed that, hey, I would appeal to Caesar, and that's why he want to go to Rome. Now he's, God's saying, hey, that's exactly what you're going to do. You're going to go appeal to Caesar. And, and you see that in verse 25 to 26, he says, So keep up your courage, men, for I have faith in God that it will happen just as he told me. Nevertheless, we must run aground on some island. See, I think this kind of sentence really gives us what we need. And our, to have a powerful faith in God. Paul says, keep up your courage because I have faith in God. It will happen just the way he told me. Wow. See, when you read your Bible, do you have the faith that you believe it will happen just oh. as he told you? Come on, bro. That you will, everything will happen just the way he said so. Or do you doubt the word of God? Okay. See, they go on and they, they indeed, they shipwreck. But nobody dies for an incredible God promises it and it doesn't happen. Right? And Paul said not a single person would be lost. Nobody's lost. So that's a victory. But um, you see, they swim to the shore, and we pick up here in chapter 28. Chapter 28, verse 1. Is this, is this an adventure or what? Yeah. Verse 1 says, Once safely on shore, we found that the island was called Malta. The islanders showed us unusual kindness. They built a fire and welcomed us all because it was raining and cold. Paul gathered a pile of brushwood, and as he put it, on the fire, a viper driven up by the heat fastened itself on his hand. When the islanders saw the snake hanging from his hand, they said to each other, This man must be a murderer. For they, for, for though he escaped from the sea, justice has not allowed him to live. And Paul shook the snake off into the fire and suffered no ill effects. The people expected him to swell up or were suddenly fall dead. But after waiting a long time and seeing nothing unusual happen to him, they changed their minds and said he was a god. Is that crazy or what? Verse 7. By that belonged to Publis, the chief official of the island. He welcomed us to his home and for three days entertained us hospitably. Wow. See, not every guy went to this estate, but probably a few of them would go. And you may wonder, why did, why did Paul get some special treatment? Why Paul? Well, you gotta remember, he was a god, and God's been good. Yeah. Verse 8. It reads: His father was sick and in bed, suffering from fever and night street. Paul went in to see him and after pray. Prayer placed his hands on him. When this had happened, the rest of the sick on the island came and were cured. They honored us in many ways, and when we were ready to sail, they furnished us with the supplies we needed. See, honor us here. The honor here has the connotation of money, meaning they gave money to Paul, wow. right? Which would actually help and benefit him in his time in Rome. Very interesting. They go to sail on in verse 11. After three months, we put out to sea in the ship that had wintered on the island. It was an Alexandrian ship, with the figurehead of the twin gods, Castor and Polis, which the world gets Jedi from. Um. 
We put it into Syracuse and stayed there three days. From there, we set a sail and arrived at Brigham. The next day, the, sh the south wind came up, and the following day, we reached Petunia. See, it's also, it's almost like he's saying, hey, all odds were against us, but we made it. Yeah. Like, we made it. All odds were against us. We weren't supposed to make it through this, but we made it, right? right. Come on. But I think what's really interesting, as they land in Rome, they get really accompanied by the disciples of the time. And that's the heart of the disciples. It's just hospitable. Yeah. You have people in your house, right? How's it been going having disciples over your house? Come on, girl. It's really encouraging the disciples, right? The campus loves coming over your house. Don't worry. If you have food on the table, they'll be there. Yeah. <laughs> right? It just happens. I, you came up for Thanksgiving, and I, I didn't know. I thought it was going to be Malik and, uh, and Brian. Two sisters came over. I was like, okay, there's food on the table. They didn't come over just for the food. But, uh, but, but you see, like, you have people over your house. It's hospitable. That's the, that's the actions of a disciple. Yeah. You're just hospitable. You have that love. Come on. But it's kind of interesting. Paul's so trustworthy. We're going to kind of skim through the, the chapter 28 just because of time, guys. But he's so trustworthy that only one guard is left, left with him the whole time. Yeah. Wow. Like he's in prison. Like he's probably the main guy that all this is happening for. And only one guard is going to be next to him. Because he's just trustworthy. Because in every situation, good or bad, are you trustworthy? Are you reliable? Bro. Are you able to get the job done? You see that in verse 21 22, the church is called a sect. And the mindset of a sect is a cult. Yeah. Meaning we will be persecuted. People call us a cult today. Yeah. That this church is a cult. Yes. We, we meet with a nice little fireplace, we dress up, but now we're cold. Oh. <laughs> That's just it. Right? Yes. Watch out for the coffee out back, it might change it. Whoa. <laughs> <laughs> but, but that's what people say. Because we love people. We hold true to the word of God, yeah. right? <laughs> and you see what happens out to Paul. It closes out, and Paul's on house arrest for a while. But people wonder, what happened to Paul next? Well, guys, the book of Acts is not about Paul. The book of Acts is about the story of how the gospel went to the entire known world. Yeah. Matter of fact, it's most likely Paul was released in a year or two because of the references made in 2 Timothy and Titus. He was imprisoned in late 66 AD, and he was ended up becoming beheaded in 67 AD. But remember, when he shares his time, it's short, and it's being poured out like a drink offering. And he only says, Luke alone is with me. Just Luke. What a faithful dude. Yeah. He was just with him, heart and soul, wherever he went. Yeah. And he's writing to Timothy, and he says, you come to me and make sure you bring John Mark. He has proven himself useful in my ministry. Yeah. And these are the closest guys. He's about to die. He's like, these are the only guys I want with me right now. I want my close friends. Oh. Who are your close friends? I think about our charge to evangelize all nations in a generation. I think about my life. I realize the most precious thing God has given me is time. I've been in LA for about 17 months now. Over those 17 months, I've lost my grandmother. We lost my, uh, Sean's grandmother. Sean's cousin, Sean was, off, was shot in the head uh, by somebody else. My cousin died from overdose. Sean's uh, grandfather has had a heart attack two weeks ago. It's a seventh heart attack. In his life. And it's just, you see, time. Life. It's so fragile. Yeah. And you know, church, we need to value the time we have together. Yeah. Yeah. We need to value the relationships we have with Christ. Yeah. Understand that God has given us time and has given us the, this great charge. We need to get involved in this adventure because we believe with all of our hearts in the motivational inspiration of Jesus Christ, the evangelization of all nations in one generation. And God bless. Thank <laughs> you.